Abel and Baker, who knows who or what, who they were. <laughs> Monkeys in space, that's right, sounds like a kid's cartoon, doesn't it? Uh, in 19, on May the 28th, 1959, they were the first U.S. animals to fly to space and to return home alive. Unfortunately, a few days later, Abel, while they were removing an electrode, the anesthesia they gave Abel, he, he died. But Baker lived to age 27, 27, and died in 1984. Does anyone know where she's buried? The Space and Rocket Center, that's right. And we were there, don't pull the picture, I'll go ahead, too late. It's all right. We were there, this isn't my picture, but I do have a picture. We were there, we used to have a membership there. Uh, we've been there several times, and, and one day we walk up, and we see that there are bananas on Baker's headstone. And what they do, people will bring bananas just to pay respect to Baker. That's their, their way of paying respect. And we just thought that was interesting. And every now and then we'll go, and sure enough, there'll be bananas on the, on the tombstone there. Um, and so that's just, we do that, not bananas, maybe, I don't know, but with people, you know, flowers on gravestones. Uh, we do different things to show respect, appreciation, to acknowledge someone's accomplishment. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's flowers on uh, a grave to show respect, love, remembrance. Maybe it's a gift for graduation uh, or a birthday or Mother's Day to show that we love someone and appreciate them. Maybe it's a plaque to give to someone for some sort of to recognize an achievement or a certificate to honor an event. We have many different ways that we show our appreciation, and our love for other people, right? And, you know, maybe it's bananas. Maybe it's something else. We give things. We do things. But there are also things that we say. Our words are powerful, aren't they? We may share an encouragement with someone, tell someone that we love them. And one of the things about Mother's Day, again, we should do it every day, but it reminds us that we need to tell our moms, tell our wives how much we appreciate them and how valuable they are to us, what they mean to us. Words can have a powerful impact in building other people up and encouraging other people and validating other people and, and, and showing them that you're proud of them, that you love them. But words can also have the opposite effect. Just as powerful as they are to build people up, words are powerful to cause great harm, great hurt, great destruction in the lives of people. And, and so this morning we're going to look at what James has to say about our need to control our tongues and what we say. The reality is we can't control our tongues, so we need to know who can, and how we can make that happen. And James is going to help us understand that this morning as we continue our series on taking it to the streets, our study through the book of James. This is not a Mother's Day message. I apologize, moms, if you were expecting one. This is not a Mother's Day message, but we want to continue our study through this book, um, this journey uh, for me, I hope for you, has been amazing, and we're going to continue to unpack this book and hopefully take away some valuable lessons on how to use our speech to honor God. The book of James, taking it to the streets, the gospel with shoes on. And we know that this book, the basis of our series, is about faith that works. Faith that's real works practically in a person's life. Real faith is faith that works. It's faith that can be seen in a person's life. Have you ever noticed uh, the unrestrained, uh, unabashed honesty of children? You know, they, they'll say whatever, right? And, and, and sometimes they'll say it at the most inappropriate times. But they're honest. There was a story about a, a kid that came to church without his parents. And during Sunday school, they were having prayer time. And uh, the little guy, he gave a prayer request. He said, I want you to pray for my mom and dad who are home right now goofing off. 
kids, you know, I bet if, if we really want, were, we probably don't want to know, but what nursery workers know about the rest of us in here today, do y'all ever think about that? I mean, that's, that's for, some of you are nursery workers. Y'all just need to, we're going to talk about gossip in a minute. Y'all don't need to tell anybody, okay? But, I mean, kids are just honest. They just, they say what's on their mind, and, and sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes maybe not so good. We've, we spend the first two years of a kid's life begging them to talk, and the next 75 begging them to be quiet. That's just the way it works. But we all have a way of sticking our foots in our mouth, of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, not thinking before we speak, and then we have to pick up the pieces afterwards. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. I don't know if there's ever been a bigger lie told to our kids, to us as kids, because words hurt. Words can be painful. Words can cause harm. They can cause trouble. They've caused wars. Words are powerful. They have great impact. And all of us have let some throwaway phrase, some word, destructive word, slip out of our mouths, only only trying to clean it up afterwards because taking it back, once you've said it, is like trying to unring a bell. You can't, once it's said, it's said. You can make amends, but a lot of times there's a lot of work that has to be done. And so what we say matters and have great, can have great impact on our lives. Now, we come today to James chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. I didn't enlist a volunteer beforehand. Does anybody want to, want to attempt to say the whole passage? You got it memorized? No? Okay. Anybody? Boy, everybody's just going to chill out on Mother's Day, right? That's okay. Well, I'm not going to try to quote it either because it's too much pressure, all right? Um, I've already done my, my time, so let's just walk through it together this morning. We don't, we don't have to say it from memory. That's okay. We'll just walk through it together um, as we look at verses 1 through 12 of chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my dear brothers, because you know that you will receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who does not stumble... Uh, in what he says, he is mature, able to control the whole body. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses they, the, so that it obeys us, we direct their whole bodies and consider ships, though very large, are driven by fierce winds. They are guided by, by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So, too... Though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how small a fire sets ablaze, sets a large uh, forest ablaze. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness. It is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, Reptile and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's image. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water? From the same opening, can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring produce fresh water. So this passage on James, it's not hard to figure out what's going on in the church, what's happening. People are not using their words to build up. At least some are using their words to tear down. So let's take that phrase, sticks and stones, and let's just redo that this morning, all right? I never liked it. It's not true. I've never, I don't think, told my kids that because it's just not true. So let's take it. Let's reword it this morning. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words reveal the maturity of the believer. Words reveal the maturity of the believer. You know, we all stumble. We slip up. It's been said that... Life is strong with banana peels. We all slip up from time to time. 
Uh, we make mistakes, and we do that with what we say. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There is certainly no one righteous on earth who does good and never sins. And sins involving our speech seem to top the list. I mean, we, we've all gotten in trouble for something that we said. Uh, we have a hard time controlling our tongues. The man who's careful, though, James says, with his speech is mature. And this is talking about completeness, mature. The, 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 the translation here really is talking about wholeness, talking about completeness in a spiritual sense. The person who's able to control his tongue, is, it shows that he's, a, he's able to discipline the whole body, James is saying. He proves that he's a mature person. Now, if we control, can control the tongue, we can control everything else in our lives. We know Jesus said in Matthew 12, 35, a good person produces good things from his storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. You know, one of the reasons words are so important is the truth that words usually lead to action. What I say can have an impact on what I do or what you do. Words usually lead to action. In World War II, there was a poster all over that read, Loose lips sink ships. Well, loose lips also wreck lives. Words can lead to action. An unguarded statement can lead to a fight. Something somebody says or I say, suddenly I have to defend myself or you have to stand up for yourself or defend yourself. Words can have great impact. Our words reflect the maturity of our hearts. Next... Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words reveal the desires of the heart. It reflects the maturity, but it also reveals the desires of my heart. What's really in here is going to come out. The, The tongue is small but powerful, and James uses a couple of analogies here to help us understand that. Three symbols of power. First, bits in large horses. Second, rudders on large ships. And third, uh, small fires that, that sparks that lead to fires, great fires. Small, but have great power. All of those things. Both the bit and the, rubber, the, the rudder have to overcome opposing forces, right? I mean, the bit has to overcome the powerful horse. The rudder the winds and the waves of the sea that are going to toss that ship back and forth. They have to overcome great forces. The human tongue is also something that has to overcome a a large opposing force. We have that old sin nature. And that sin nature, even though we're saved, we're redeemed, we still battle that sin nature, and that sin nature would love for us to live the same way that we did before. Would love to cause us to sin, and that can be a powerful force, and it can impact what we say. And the tongue, we have to fight that. So it's a great opposing force. When Jesus though, controls our tongue, we have the the bit that's controlled, right? The rider of the horse controls, the the captain of the ship controls the rudder. Something's got to be in control of our tongue, someone. And we can't control it. When left to our own devices, we're going to mess up. It's uncontrollable. So Jesus Christ, he has to be the one that's in control. He's got to be the one that guards our mouths. We have to live in submission to him. But when Jesus is in control, we don't have to be afraid of saying the wrong thing or even saying the right things the wrong way, because we do that too, don't we? It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. In Psalm 141, verses 3 through 4, David said this. He said, Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. Keep watch at the door of my lips. Do not let my heart turn to any evil thing or perform wicked acts with evildoers. Do not let me feast on their delicacies. David knew that the heart is the key to right speech. In order for God to have control of my tongue, he has to have control of my heart. Jesus emphasizes this too, the heart being the key to right speech. When he talked to the Pharisees, he said in Matthew 12, 34, Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. If my heart is dirty, my speech will eventually be dirty. It will come out. The rudder of a ship is subject to the will of the pilot, right? The bit of the rider 
of the bit of the horse is subject to the rider of the horse, wherever he wants to go. And so the tongue is subject to the heart. It's subject to the owner. So whoever owns the heart, whoever owns the tongue, controls the tongue. So when Jesus is Lord of my heart, then he's going to be Lord of my lips too. What I say will match what's on the inside. Either way, and if Christ is on the inside, if he's controlling me, then my speech will reflect that. So I need to ask, are the desires of my heart, are they mine or are they God's? Are they my own desires or are they the Lord's desires? Who controls my heart? The bit and the rudder also have power to direct, which means they affect my life and the life of others. My tongue affects my life and the life of others. It can direct the course of my life. A runaway horse, a shipwreck, it could mean death, right? It could mean serious injury. Uh, for the passengers of the, the rider of the horse, the people in the path of the horse, the, the, the riders on the ship, uh, it could mean great harm at least, death even worse if something, if that ship loses control, that horse loses control. And words that we say affect the lives of others. It, they don't just affect us, they can, but they can affect the lives of others. And here's what we need to, to, to learn Never underestimate the guidance you give by the words you speak or do not speak. You know, sometimes not speaking is just as bad as speaking. Not speaking up, not saying a word of encouragement, saying I love you, or a word of correction in love. You know, sometimes speaking is destructive, sometimes not speaking. Don't underestimate the guidance that you can give. Don't, don't think, oh, I have no influence. They're not really going to listen to me. You never know. Who's listening to what you say? The tongue has the power to direct others to the right choices or to the wrong choices. And we would all do well to read the book of Proverbs, especially the many references to speech. Let's just take a few verses here. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. Proverbs 12.22, lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but faithful people are his delight. In Proverbs 10, 19, when there are many words, sin is unavoidable. But the one who controls his lips is prudent. Words reveal the desires of our hearts. You can say the right things for a time, but eventually what's on the inside is going to come out. So, sticks and stones may break my bones, but our words reveal the desire of our hearts. Also, our words reveal the influence of evil. If there is great influence of evil in our lives, our words are going to reveal that. And they, words, negative words reveal the influence of evil on our world. Proverbs 16, 27, a worthless person digs up evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. You know, fire can begin with a small spark, right? I mean, it doesn't take much to light a fire. The Chicago fire, most believe it started in a barn. Mrs. Leary, O'Leary was milking her cow. The cow kicked over a lantern, started the fire, and before, we, before they knew it, uh, a huge fire that burned nearly four miles and claimed about 250 lives. I mean, just a small spark, and that's, that fire's well known. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's gained a lot of notoriety then, and, and we still, when I mention Chicago Fire, you probably, even though you may not know the details, you know about it, right? Interestingly enough, though, the same day, on October the 8th, 1871, that wasn't the biggest fire in the Midwest that happened. In the north woods of Wisconsin, a small spark lit a fire that burned for an entire month, taking more lives than the Chicago Fire. Uh, Billions of yards of precious timber were lost because of this fire. Just one little small spark lit those fires. Didn't take much, and that's the reality. One one small thing that we say can set the world ablaze if we're not careful. We We can set the world on fire for Christ, or we can set the world on fire for Satan. We can cause great, great joy, or we can cause great harm. Just from one small spark, Proverbs 26, 20, and 21. Those who misuse the tongue, misuse the tongue are guilty of spiritual arson, is what James is telling us. 
Proverbs 26, without wood, fire goes out. Without gossip, conflict dies down. As charcoal for embers and wood for fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The fact is, in, in some churches, there are members, there are leaders who cannot control their tongues. And some of us, we've seen the damage that that can cause. The result is destruction, and that's what's happening. Evidently, that's what James is, is addressing here, is that people are not controlling what they say. They're not, they want to teach. They want to be in positions of authority, but they can't control their speech, and they're not using their speech to honor God. And like a fire, the tongue can heat things up. David wrote this in Psalm 39, verses 1 through 3. I said, I will guard my ways so that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. I was speechless and kept quiet. Speechless and quiet, I kept silent, even from speaking good, and my pain intensified. My heart grew hot within me as I mused. I, a fire burned. I spoke with my tongue. You know, a hot head and a hot heart can lead to burning words that we will regret later on if we don't get control, if we don't allow God to get control of our hearts. Evidently, David had a temper, and he had to have God's help to control it. Couldn't control it on his own. We can't control it on our own. It's no wonder Solomon, his son, wrote this in Proverbs 17, 27. The one who has knowledge restrains his words. And the one who keeps a cool head is a person of understanding. In Proverbs 14, 29, he said, A patient person so shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. James says that the fire of the loose tongue is activated, is set on fire itself. By hell. Fire pollutes. I mean, it causes, you know, smoke, pollution causes destruction. Well, the tongue can pollute. Our speech can pollute as well. Fiery words can pollute a home. It can, can uh, pollute a Bible study. It pollute a, a church, a family, a workplace, whatever the case may be. Gossip, innuendo, flattery. You know, gossip is saying something Behind somebody's back that you would never say to their face, flattery is saying something to their face that you would never say behind their back. <laughs> Both are just as bad, just as harmful. Gossip, flattery, um, innuendo, criticism, blasphemy is probably the worst of the worst, right? Uh, things that we say. These things bring nothing but pollution, those types of things that I just mentioned. The only thing that can wash away the pollution of the tongue controlled by evil is the blood of Jesus Christ. Only if he has control of my life, my heart, will my tongue be controlled. He will control my tongue. Only then will my words build up and not burn down, tear down. Fire burns, it hurts. Our words can burn, they can hurt. Fire spreads, and the more fuel you give it, the faster and farther it will spread. The more gossip, the more I fuel that story, that fire, the more it spreads, the more harm it can cause. The tongue sets the course of our lives on fire, James says. And this is literally referring to the center of our existence. I used uh, Timmy's bicycle wheel a few weeks ago, and I'm going to use it again in a little different way. You know, what James, kind of what James is saying is like the center of our existence, think of it as the hub of this wheel, our hearts, who we are. And like, just like this hub is connected to everything on this wheel, there's nothing on this wheel that's not connected to this hub via the spokes, right? So if the center of this wheel is bad or missing, what's, how, how well is this thing, gonna, would you put your kid on a bicycle with the hub missing? No. I mean, if the center's bad, everything's bad. There's no strength that's not going to hold up. And what James is saying is that our tongues affect the center of our existence. I mean, they have the, the, the ability to impact the center. It does, the center of our existence. It can affect the purity. It can affect the strength. It can cause our entire lives because if the tongue impacts the center of our existence, then it's going to have impact on the, the entire, our entire being. That's what he's saying. That's how powerful speech can be. That's how destructive speech can be. On the flip side, that's how positive speech can be. If it's used for good, if it's used for building up, if it's used for encouragement. We need to think 
and understand appropriately. James is trying to get his readers to understand just how powerful what they're saying can be and how destructive it is. That's why he's addressing it. It spreads, and as it spreads, fire destroys. And the words we say have the power to destroy. Did you know that for every word in Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, 125 lives were lost in World War II? I mean, words are powerful. Words are powerful. Our own words may not have caused wars, may not have wrecked lives, but they, maybe they have. I, you know, I don't know. But they, they probably have caused damage and hurt at some point in our lives. We've all said things we've regretted, shouldn't have said. That's why it's important for our speech to be full of grace, Colossians 4, 6 says. Not only is the tongue like a fire, but it's also like a dangerous animal. It's restless. It cannot be ruled. It seeks its prey and then pounces on it. Uh, Mandy and I have taken the kids a few times to Harmony Safari Park. Y'all been there, Huntsville? You can drive through the park, all these wild animals. It's a lot of fun. It can also be a little scary. One time we went, Mandy's folks still have, they're driving this van now, and it still has this mark on it. We were driving our van through the Harmony Saf- uh, Safari, and, you know, you can buy food, roll your window down. Well, I mean, they... Animals don't have boundaries, okay? They don't have the, the, the personal bubble. They don't respect that. And at one point, we had, like, giraffes heads in our car. And, I mean, all, I mean it got a little, little scary. And, and we ran out of food. And I don't remember exactly what happened. I just remember that one of the giraffes reached down and grabbed our side view mirror and just bit a chunk out of it. I mean, evidently, he didn't get as much food as he wanted. Bit a chunk out of the mirror, and you, I mean, if Mandy's folks were here still, the, the mirror still got a chip missing out of it. Uh, and one of the, the goats, like, rammed the front of the, the car, put a dent in it. I mean, you know, it was all, all in good fun. But, you know, it was exciting. The kids loved it. Timmy, Timmy's tossing them food, you know, just, just letting them go. Um, but, we, we, you know, we had a great time. Our car was never the same. But it, it goes to show animals are beautiful, right? They can be fun. You can have a nice, friendly pet. But animals can also be pretty dangerous. You know, there was a moment there where I'm driving and I'm worried about, you know, whether or not that giraffe's going to take a plug out of one of my kids. You know, they could be dangerous. You get done with that and you go to the snake house at Safari Park. You talk about danger. I mean, some snakes are harmless. I think all snakes are bad, but that's my personal opinion. But some of them can kill. Some of them won't. Because some of them actually literally have poison coming from their mouths. Think about that for a moment. You know, animals can be dangerous. They can cause harm. Some, some animals are poisonous. And with humans, not with fangs, but we can, poison can come from our mouths. We can cause great harm. Words have the power of great destruction. Some animals can cause great destruction, James reminds us, but they can also be tamed. Animals can be tamed. Uh, fire can be tamed, right? I mean, fire can be controlled. When a, an animal is tamed, it's, a, it's a, work, a, a workhorse or a work animal, right? It can work, do more than a human can. When fire is tamed, it can be turned into power, great power. These things could be tamed, but what James is telling us is that no human being can tame the tongue. So how is it tamed? Well, the only way the tongue is tamed is by God. If God lights the fire and God controls it, the tongue can be an incredible tool for winning the laws, for preaching the gospel, building up the church, discipling other believers. The important thing, of course, is that the heart has to be under submission, under control of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So the heart's got to be pure. The heart's got to be right. The heart has to be controlled by Christ. If the heart is filled with hatred, Satan will light the fire. But if the heart is filled with love, then God will light the fire. If the heart is filled with the Holy Spirit, God will set the world on fire through you for his kingdom and his glory. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Let's look at our last rephrasing of this statement. 
Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words reveal the condition of the soul. They not only reveal the condition of my heart, we see the influence of evil, but they reveal the condition of my soul. Ultimately, James says the tongue can praise our Lord, it can curse men. Just like bitter salt water cannot produce fresh water, neither can the tongue of a rebellious, impure heart produce a blessing. Evidently, James had seen some contradictory actions. And you tie this into verse 1. Some people were wanting to teach, and they're, but they're not using their speech in an honorable way. They don't understand the influence. They don't understand the standard that leaders are held to in the church. He's saying, be careful what you seek. Leadership. If you're not in control of your tongue, that means your heart's not in control. God doesn't have control of your heart. And there are great consequences, especially for leaders who use their tongues in a destructive way. Jewish Christians were speaking nicely to people at the church, but the same people would leave the church and curse someone when they got angry. You bless and curse with the same mouth, James says. These things should not be. His main point here is that whatever comes out of the mouth unfailingly reveals what's on the inside. The condition of my heart determines the words that I say. Again, you can pretend, you can put on for a while, but eventually what's in there is going to come out. He talks about water, life-giving. You know, water is life-giving. And the words that we say, they can, they can be life-giving. They can refresh They can build others up. They can lead others, point people to Christ. They can model Christ. They can be refreshing. Because when, you know, water can be destructive too, right? I mean, floods cause great damage. Um, But when we take a drink of water, we don't think floods, do we? Unless somebody just dumps it all on your head or you're trying to drink from a fire hydrant maybe. But if I just take a sip of water, cold, nice cold water, I don't think flood, I think refreshing, don't I? Especially if I'm really thirsty. Man, that's cool, that's refreshing. Makes you feel good. And water can do that. Words can do that. The truth is we can't survive without water. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks rashly like a piercing sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. It's refreshing. And Paul's prayer in Romans was that he would refresh the saints in Rome when he came to them. Romans 15, 32. He talked about Christians often who had refreshed him, who had encouraged him. Water cleanses also. Water can cleanse. You know, there's a washing basin. There was a washing basin in the Old Testament temple. So the priests would would clean their hands and their feet. And God's word is like a spiritual water that washes us it cleans us the word the word of god john 15 3 you are already clean because of the word i've spoken to you jesus said jesus gave himself for the church ephesians 5 26 27 in order to make her holy cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word his word has cleansing power he did this to present the, to the church to himself and splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. You know, God's word has the power to cleanse, but our words can too, especially when we speak the word of God. You know, God can use us in what we say to lead others, to point other people toward repentance. And God's the one that convicts, the Holy Spirit convicts, he draws people to himself, but he chooses to use us in that process of the Great Commission, of sharing the gospel, winning souls, and what we say is, is a key component in that. The tongue is also refreshing because it's like a tree. You know, the geographical locations of trees in the Bible are important. They're vitally, they were vitally important to the economy in this day and time. They, they, they help the soil. I mean, they're important for us now for the same reason they help the soil. They provide beauty. They provide shade. They bear fruit. They produce. You know, our words can help shelter, they can comfort, they can display fruit, they can help produce fruit in the lives of others, or they can have the opposite effect. But words can be refreshing, they can be productive, they can be life-giving, injecting life and encouragement into somebody. They can help feed a hungry soul who's in desperate need of encouragement. 
spiritual food. Proverbs 10, 21, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die of a lack of sense. The Bible's straightforward. Now, the most important thing about a tree is the root system, though, right? Comparing to a tree, if the roots don't go down deep, the, the tree's not going to produce. It's not going to survive. It's not going to live. And, and if we are rooted in, the, in God's word, if we are rooted in, in spiritual things, in Christ, and we, we are deep and we're spiritual and we're maturing, then our words will be a reflection of that. But if we're not rooted deeply in Christ, then our words will be a f- reflection of that. And, and so if the, the lesson here is that, that we have to be grounded, we have to be rooted, so that the fruit of our words, the fruit of our fellowship with God will be reflected in our words. Isaiah 50 verse 4, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are instructed to know how to sustain the weary with a word. He awakens me each morning. He awakens my ear to listen like those being instructed. You know, one of the reasons that Jesus was able to say the right words, I mean, he's God, but he was also human. And one of the reasons he was able to say the right words at the right time was because he spent time with his father regularly. He was grounded. I mean, he was in connection with the father he, he had healthy fellowship, perfect fellowship with the Father. Mark 135, very early in the morning, while he, it was still dark, Jesus got up, he went out, he made his way to a deserted, deserted place, and there he was praying. He did this, and he did it frequently. I mean, he sets the standard. He sets, he's a model for us. If we want to be grounded, if we want to have our roots down deep, not only our words, but our actions, our lives reflect that, then we've got to have a healthy relationship with our Father. We've got to spend time with Him regularly and daily. If we're going to have tongues that refresh, then we've got to spend time with the Lord each day and learn from Him. We've got to get our spiritual roots deep into His Word. We need to pray. We need to meditate on His Word. That's, that's why we're memorizing James. That's why that challenge. We, I want to get us all of us in a habit of of meditating on Scripture, internalizing Scripture, because that's when it changes us. When we allow it to simmer, when we allow the Holy Spirit to, to use it and, and to, to dig into those deep places in our, our soul, our inner being that we don't even know are there, that need to be changed and transformed and sharpened. God's Word has the power to do that. And, if, and you know, speech is just one of the areas that's, that's affected by that. But if we want our speech to build up, to honor, to encourage, to disciple, then we've got to allow God's Word to go down deep. We've got to be rooted. But James gives a warning. A fountain cannot give two different kinds of water. A tree cannot bear two different kinds of fruit. Nature reproduces after its kind. And if the tongue is inconsistent, there's something radically wrong with the heart. A tongue that blesses the Father and then turns around and curses men made in in God's image, he says, is in desperate need of spiritual help. It needs to be cleaned. You know, in our society, we like cleaning products, right? You can visit some other parts of the world and they don't like them quite as much as we do or can't get to them quite as much as we do. But we have access to them and we love them, don't we? We use them, whatever they are. I brought a few with me this morning, just grabbed a few things coming in. I've got... Something that's become well known to all of us in the past couple of years, hand sanitizer. All right, what do you use hand sanitizer for? You kill germs, clean your hands. You don't, maybe you don't have, you know, soap, hot water and soap. I'll never forget when the pandemic started. I was in Walmart and somebody was looking for hand sanitizer. They were out. And they were asking the, the, the employee at Walmart, you don't have hand sanitizer? No, we don't have it. When are you going to get some in? I'm not sure. We should have a shipment coming in. And, and I don't even think he meant to say it this way, but it was funny. He was like, you know, you could use soap and water. I know it's novel, <laughs> but you don't have to have hand sanitizer. But it's a quick, convenient, and effective way to kill germs, and you can wash your hands. But is hand sanitizer, you could try this. I wouldn't recommend it, okay? Could, would, would hand sanitizer clean your whole body? No, I wouldn't try it either, right? Uh, we got, speaking of just good old-fashioned soap and water, I got some hand soap here. You know, have hand sanitizer, good warm water and soap. But this is hand soap. 
It's not body wash. You know, hand soap, you could use it again, but I wouldn't use this for your whole body. I mean, for one thing, you know, you'd buy, have to buy a lot of bottles of this. To, <laughs> but I'm just washing my hands with this. It's not getting my whole body clean. All right, what about, we're talking about the mouth today. What about the mouth? I brought some mouthwash with me. All right, it's a good thing. You, you know, it may kill some germs, freshen your breath a little bit. But if I want my mouth to be healthy, what do I need to do? You got a brush, you got a floss. I would recommend going to the dentist every now and then. I don't like the dentist either, but I mean, these things all have something in common. They are not intended to clean the whole body. I mean, they're intended as, as kind of a quick fix, right? My hands are dirty. I need to clean them real quick. Or I don't have soap and water. I'm just going to use a hand sanitizer and kill some germs. I don't have time to brush my teeth. I'm out and about. Maybe I've got this in my office or my car. I can swig a little mouthwash and not totally offend somebody the next time I talk to them. Quick fixes are great for what the purpose that they serve, but not intended to clean the whole person. If I want to get clean, I got to get in the shower, use soap, water, wash my hair, shampoo, the whole thing. If I want my mouth to be clean, I've got a brush, I got a floss, I've got to spend some time. I've got to go deeper than just a surface cleaning. I mean, I, I can't just do a quick fix if I truly want to be clean. And the same is true with our mouths. If my mouth is going to be clean, if my words are going to be clean, I've got to go deeper than just a quick fix. I've got to allow God to transform me from the inside out. It begins with my heart. Because Matthew 15, 18, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart and it defiles a person. We need to ask God to enter our lives first, to cleanse us beginning on the inside, to transform us, to sanctify us, to justify us, and then sanctify us daily as we submit, as we allow his word to work through our lives. And I want to close with Isaiah. We can learn something from Isaiah's cleansing and put it into practice in our lives. Beginning in Isaiah 6, 5, he encounters God and he says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And live among a people of unclean lips. Because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. So we need to recognize the need for cleansing, right? We encounter the holiness of God and see our filth. And then, if we want to be clean, we need to submit to the cleansing process. Which Isaiah does as well. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. We have to submit to the cleansing process. The blood of Jesus covers our sins. He enters our life and he cleans us up. He forgives us of sin, but only he can do that. And then we've submitted to the cleaning process. Now we need to prepare to serve and be willing to serve. Isaiah, once he's clean, he says, I heard a voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah's response, here I am. Send me. And then we're willing to go. We've got to maintain that healthy walk with Christ daily in his word. Our roots going down deep. Because there are going to be times where we struggle with the flesh. There are going to be times where we mess up. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to do the wrong thing. And it's that ongoing process of sanctification. Only when God completely has control of who we are, our inner person, our hearts, and our lives, will everything we do, including our speech, honor him and point others to him. This is what the gospel looks like. One of the ways that we see the gospel taken to the streets by what we say and how we affect others with our speech. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, I'm thankful for the power of words, God. I'm thankful that you can take things that people say and use those things to impact their hearts and their lives to lead them to a saving knowledge of who you are. You choose to allow us to be a part of your kingdom work and that includes what we say and how we say it. And, and Lord, I... You know, it's a mystery to me that you would allow us to be a part of that process. Why? You do, but you do. But we also know the destruction that can be caused by words. The harm, the pain, 
the suffering, the damage that can be caused. So God, we want to make sure that what we say is honoring to you, that's encouraging to others, that's building up your church, advancing your kingdom, pointing others to you. And and we know that in order for that to happen, our hearts have to be controlled by you. And in order for that to happen, we have to be yours. That means that we have to be in a relationship with you. And there may be somebody here today or watching online that, that they've never come to a point in their lives where they've recognized their need for salvation and that you, Jesus, are the only one that can give that salvation. Your death on the cross for our sins, your resurrection, you offer forgiveness for sin and salvation, but we have to receive that. And maybe there's somebody here today who's never done that. And right now they just need to invite you into their lives. Or they need to come during this time of commitment and allow me to share with them more about how to do that. But for those of us who belong to you, just use this time to evaluate our hearts. To show us areas that we may not have turned over to you. That we're trying to hold on. That maybe are affecting how we treat others, what we say to others. Or maybe other areas of our lives, how we live. Lord, just work in us and through us. Just speak to us now and show us how to respond to your word. And thank you for the opportunity to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?